Hello there, Lisa Fitzgibbon here from Project 7 and welcome to our check-in service. So this is where we're going to hook up with our previous headline producers and our alumni from all around the world. We're going to find out where you are, what you're doing, what you're working on, how you're doing it, that kind of thing. Anyone who's been to one of our Project 7 events knows what an intensely challenging and rewarding week it can be where forever friendships are made and creative connections that last are created. And uh, this is the check-in service. So we're going to try and put everyone together so we can hook you up with your Project 7 kin. And today we're checking in with Project 7 headline producer, composer, doubler player and Mercury Music Prize winner, Talvin Singh OBE. An accomplished tablet player, performer and producer, Talvin is renowned for his maverick approach of stitching together the rich fabric of classical Indian music with the more contemporary sounds of drum and bass and digital electronica. Alongside his critically acclaimed album releases, Talvin has collaborated with many artists including Madonna, Massive Attack, Susie and the Banshees, Bjork, Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan and Blondie, just to name a few. Talvin Singh's practice, performances and production is constantly evolving as his music touches the lives and the hearts of his global audience. And today we're checking in with Talvin Singh. Hello Talvin, it's Lisa Fitzgibbon here. How are you? Hello Lisa, it's so nice to see you. Yeah, you too. I'm nice good, to I'm, I'm very well, I'm very well. I'm, I'm as well as one can be at this time and I'm just, you know, focusing on, on creativity Awesome. And where are you, Talvin? Um, I'm in the studio, Utopia Sound, which is in a creative hub, um, which is called Old Jet. So we have a number of studios here and we have amazing creative people from photographers to graphic designers to fine artists. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great community. Um, so the studio's here and... And yeah, and just kind of, you know, pretty much work out of here. It's been about almost like four or five years now. What are you working on at the moment? What's your what's your creative uh, output? What are you doing? I'm finishing off um, an album, which is a kind of producer's co-songwriter album. And I think, I think the project we have done in the past has been quite an inspiration. That's kind of... I think like pushed me, kind of pushed me, you know, through that, to look through that window. So I thought, okay, well, let me just like, let me just work on the songs. And and I'm really happy with it because one of the key elements I found is that I can take all the production away and, and I've got my kind of voice in there as a double player, as a percussionist. Mm. So So we could take everything away and we could just do the songs just with vocals, vocal roads or guitar and, and doubler. Yeah, I feel it can be a little bit karaoke if you go out live and you start like bringing a multi-track of samples and stuff, you know, mm. playing. So I want to avoid that. Mm. Well, you come from a tradition of performing live. So I would imagine that most your your acoustic tendencies, um, as opposed to your production, which is highly, uh, you would say, programmed <laughs> yeah yeah sides of Talvin Singh yeah I mean back in the day I was not only as a percussionist you know I was kind of playing on a lot of records but um but I ended up kind of as a percussionist live I ended up you know working out a lot of the kind of s- samples and the stems and how to trigger them live back in the you know kind of yeah, play eighties, early nineties. I did that for Bjork as well. You know, mm. Guy Six were for myself. You know, we went into the multi track and we started, you know, triggering a lot of those samples live. And so, so we're kind of used to that. But I think it, like I said, it's something which I don't really um, feel I want to do so much anymore because it just feels a little bit karaoke for me now. You know, to do that kind of thing, mm. um, unless it's a really electronic project, and then. And then that's a totally different, different thing. And you've got a new system there at the studio, haven't you? What's your s- setup like? Yeah, the last decade of so I, I haven't really had a desktop system. I've, I've been working with the laptop because you know they they just got so powerful and uh, and the the 
yeah, the, the kind of machine I've got now, you know, it, it is very powerful. But yeah, it could be more powerful because, <laughs> yeah, because the last, the last year, I found there's been quite a game changer in terms of uh, plugins. Like, okay. you know, they've really taken it on, on a next level. Plugins like Soothe and Spiff, kind of like, you know, just plugins which kind of identify the, the, the digital residue which you, which you get mm. in, in recording um, above, you know, whatever, 48K. And, you know, I don't really like looking at screens when I'm listening to music yeah. and, and, and adjusting fine tuning kind of parameters, EQ and stuff, you know. So I've got kind of outboard gear to do most of that work. But I have to say that they're, they're, the last last year was just amazing how many great plugins mm. just came on the scene. Is there a plugin that you can recommend to other producers? I think um, the Oak Sound, the, the Spiff, uh, for kind of more like kind of transient shaping and... And then the Soothe, Soothe 3, I think is amazing because, you know, what you find with digital and um, and actually I, I, I was kind of with Chenzo because he's, Chenzo Townsend, his studio is just 10 minutes away and he was emphasizing the fact that he has to take top end away. And uh, because digital, if you're recording well on digital, um, and good converters, you know, you, you're gonna you're gonna get all of that eerie stuff, mm. and but but some of it with some residue, so you have to be really careful. Um, so I'm kind of yeah, I'm really happy with with the system, but you know, most of the writing I do on this MTC, yeah. And, uh, so That's I've got your a little black there. box. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I would say about the Akai is like if you're sampling into it. Um, or using any of the, the, what happens is it's it's got a kind of it's got some kind of compression if I feel built in for that kind of MPC sound, and sometimes I don't want that because because it's such of the with the big screen on there, it's it's and it it goes up to ninety six k, and mm-hmm. I use it up to ninety six k. You know, sometimes I just want to do more kind of less beat stuff on it mm-hmm. and just program mm-hmm. on it. So. So I wish you can just switch that compression sound off a little bit, but it's got it's got that MPC sound, which people love. So a lot of the writing I do on there because I don't want to feel like I'm listening to my favorite album and reading my favorite book at the same time. You're a classically trained tabla player, and that's no mean feat. Um, the discipline is quite well. It's a life it takes a lifetime to learn your instrument properly can you explain to us a little bit about your learning of the tabla and your process um why you came to that instrument i think the instrument kind of came to me at such a young age like the sound the sound of the instrument and also the whole kind of the the physics the ergonomics of like sitting cross-legged and playing this instrument i think maybe I was attracted to that idea and, and, and it could be something um, of the kind of, yeah, spiritual space, which, which I was attracted to, a kind of yogic kind of um, energy about playing this instrument. And I started playing very early age. I learned from a few visiting masters which would come and be on tour and I would learn things from them. And then I really found my teacher who, who was really devoted to guiding me musically, not just with double up, but just musically, spiritually. And, um, and so I, li- I, t- I stayed with him for some time. And I actually lived in his house from the age of 15 on and off. And, and still, you know, I'm still connected and I'm um, still learning. And so, so I think the double up kind of, Double has really given me a kind of extra, I would say, a sonic understanding of of kind of sounds, rhythms, 
tuned, it's tuned percussion, isn't it, tabla? It's, it's a tuned percussion instrument, exactly, because mm-hmm. like when you, so so when you see, um, you know, the open stroke, it's like a gong. Mm. And so this note, you know, that's a tone different. Mm. It's, it's an equal temperament of a tone. And then you got all the in between kind of tones. Mm. You know, so so it's highly sophisticated. And all the overtones and, um, as well. I can hear all the overtones there as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what you're playing with. And, and that's how the language kind of, we don't know what came first, whether it was the language or the actual instrument, you know, but maybe it was just hand in hand, a kind of symbiosis of traditions. Because not only are you a tabla player, you're a producer, a performer, you're a music theorist and a DJ. Um, I mean, I know that we have to wear many hats nowadays, but uh, if you were to choose one, which would you say your favourite Talvin Singh hat would be? I, th- I think tabla because it's you know for me it's because the vastness of it. I think um, I have to keep quite a central focus on tabla because uh, because of the, because of its demand. I think you know it becomes an instrument which um, which isn't always about production or entertainment. It can offer those services, mm. but but it becomes an instrument which is a meditative instrument. And tomorrow, if you don't feel like going to the studio, you don't feel like recording, or you don't even feel like playing live, or you can't, you're restricted from playing live <laughs> concerts, you can still sit and meditate with this instrument. So your solo album, OK, was released in 1998. Um, to critical and commercial success. You won the Mercury Music Prize and the South Bank Prize with that album. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the production process of that because you recorded that album in five different places, Mumbai, Madras, Okinawa, New York and London. Um, Nowadays that happens all the time, okay, but I presume that you're lugging two-inch tapes here and there, um, that you you recorded it analog if you did. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about your production process and the decision that you made back then to actually record it in so many different locations. This idea of this kind of travelogue album for me was obviously exciting. It was a dream for me to make this album, to have the opportunity to make this album. And I took liberties and advantage of that situation where I, 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 there were so many musicians I wanted to engage with and work with, people like Bill Laszlo in New York, you know, because I was listening to what he was doing with his label and um, putting out all these amazing editions of music and, and kind of having a bit like on your sound, like what Adrian Sherwood was doing, where, you know, just loads, it's a melting pot of loads of musicians from different parts, different traditions coming together. And the experience, you know, the experience of like traveling to these places like Okinawa, Bombay was obviously, a, that was the first place which, needed to happen, um, you know, because, because I've, you know, I've always been very fascinated by the recording industry of Bombay because I, when I started getting into records and how records are made and that this mysticism actually developed about studios and studio equipment, it developed from listening to records which were made in Bombay mm. in the mm. 80s because, you know, especially this kind of saturated distortion which you heard on those Bollywood records. When I heard that stuff as a kid, I just, it just, I mean, it just really, it blew my mind. It yeah. just, mm-hmm. it attracted me to, to the quest of knowing how, how can you get that sound? You know, 10 doubler players playing with one, like, you know, RCA microphone, like, boom, yeah. down. Well, you know, it's interesting because to get equipment into Bombay from Germany and UK and Russia, um, you have to pay around, like, 100 or sometimes even 200% duty. Uh. 
Yeah. And, and, and so they, one of the chief engineers in the studios had basically said, when the VU meters are in the red, when, all, when the LEDs and stuff are in the reds, that's when you start recording. Because, because he, he actually thought that means on. Oh, is that why everything's so hot? Is that why everything's so that's, crunchy? Oh, exactly. 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 So everyone followed that tradition. Oh. And it became the sound. It became the sound. I love that so, stuff. I know. It's an amazing, amazing story. And, uh, and so, so that's how it all happened. In London, the strong room was the headquarters, and it was pretty much, you know, we used the knee from because I did like that sound. I wanted that kind of, I wanted that warm, kind of warm, saturated sound. And we got, we got an, an interesting sound on the knee. But, you know, we ended up recording on radar. That was our main machine. In Bombay, we used the Tascam. I still have them. I have the Tascam D. I have three of them. In Bombay, we, we, recorded with DA38s, they became really popular at that time. Yeah. And the digital tape became I remember popular. remember DA38s. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but then we transferred all, everything we recorded, we ended up transferring onto Radar, Atari okay. Radar. The record, you know, I was, I, was, I was producing the record. I won't say executive producing, I was the kind of producer, mm. but I had such an amazing, an amazing engineer uh, from recording to housekeeping to mixing. And in a way, he was a kind of a co-producer. He was like a hired co-producer because I, I'm not a really good housekeeper. You know, I've learned how to do it. I've learned how to do it recently and I've learned the discipline of it. But because I'm so erratic and I want to just get in and do things and get dirty, you know, that stuff gets left behind. So Tristan was really, really, he was brilliant, Tristan Norwell. We had a fantastic time recording. It was intense, though. Mm. It was intense. I would finish at 3, like 3.34. Pat would call me a cab or sushi. They would call me a cab on account, I'd get home. And my start time was 9 o'clock. Mm. And they had to be in the studio by 8. Mm. So, I mean, that was rough. Mm. That was rough. Hard, hard work. You know, but sessions were like that back in the day. It was like, it was, it was just like that. If you had a, you know, the idea of like economically and ergonomically working with a budget to make a record, you would have, you and you want to display all of your instruments and set up everything in the studio. So, so you, you would have a lockout for like three weeks. Mm. And if you had a lockout, you wanted to make use of the time, not resting and sleeping. So, so, so you just—that's how it was. That was the, that was the kind of style. Everybody was on that, you know. Oh, working remotely with somebody can be quite frustrating, I find personally. So, do you do a lot of remote working nowadays? With uh, now that you're sort of stuck in the studio as such, I, I think I'm just starting. There's been a whole um, list of artists, which, which in fact, Kobo, who, who my publishers now. Uh, you know, they've been quite amazing uh, at realising uh, the change, actually. And um, and so that, that's been really impressive. And so I've got some kind of sessions with some writers, artist writers in Los Angeles, which I'm just going to start kind of sending them some ideas, some beats, and, and then take it from there. Take it from there. It's... Um, but to be honest, you know, um, when I set up the studio, it was pretty much the idea was just I wanted to record things myself, you know. Mm. And uh, like on this record, most all, most of the singers I recorded, uh, Lou Rhodes from from Lamb, um, you know, she came here for a day, you know, because when I'm recording vocals, I like to record the vocals right. I don't want to use so much post plugins and stuff to sort stuff out. I want to record it really well, especially voices. And uh, I'm quite, I've become quite passionate about recording voices. I've got some really nice microphones here. I've got like a, I've got a quite unique setup, just pretty much for vocals. 
which is up here, which is a um, so it's a DW Fern a VT7 valve compressor made by Doug Fern, mm-hmm. and then and on top of that, part of the chain is a PEQ Lang Lang EQ, which is like like the Poltec EQs but solid state. Nice. And it's got like a 20K thing going on, like ear band for vocals. And it's just so amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's really, really beautiful. So I, so even like sessions I did recently in Bombay with the vocals, I recorded them as clean as I could. And then, um, and then I went through this chain afterwards mm-hmm. uh, just, just to build this really nice kind of harmonic color. Got a few little kind of... Um, processing chains now established especially over the last two three years mm. and i miss i miss it when i don't use that that's becoming the sound and and i was quite aware when we did our project together in brighton i was also quite aware of all of that and so i brought a couple of things and i was really impressed Bev Lee. she you know she said to me and very softly she said you know i love the way you recorded the vocals and i was like yeah are you sure and then when i just heard it i did nothing to them Mm-hmm. hardly and they sounded and I said to her I said you know okay you know it was a great take it's a good take I think but you know I might have to clean a few things up and you know I use melodyne just in a very subtle way yeah, yeah. don't worry about it but I might have to and I didn't use any of it I went really? through everything and I didn't use any of it because you know and I said to her like afterwards I said Beverly you know this is really amazing because you know when you have a when you have this take where there's no editing involved, it's just expression. It's like your storytelling, and it's, it doesn't have to be perfect, but yet it's perfect because you can't take anything away oh. and you can't add anything. That's the piece of art. You're talking about the uh, Project 7 in 2018 when you were a headline producer That's in the right. Sound Studio. Yeah. And when I had that lovely Japanese room. Yes, yes, you were in the, uh, the Prism Sound uh, Sing Star suite or, or Velvet, lovely plush. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the song you're talking about is the Hold Me In song. And I understand um, I, I, t- I spoke to Bev last week and that was her favourite moment, her most memorable projects ever moment because you went down the beach and you recorded some location uh, sounds. And then yeah. the vocal that you're talking about, she delivered that in one take, I understand. She did it in one take. Yeah. So she can you tell us a little bit day. about that day then, Telf, and how you sort of approached the, the recording of that song? I think, I think her energy was a kind of reflection of everything which took place. Um, I think she allowed things to happen. And I think that's really important. That's, that's very important in a studio environment or any creative environment is to allow things to happen. Mm. And often, you know, in particular singers, I think, it's quite multifaceted of vocalists because you've got to deal with lyrics, you've got to deal with your intonation, you've got to deal with the most subtle aspect of an instrument, which is your body, your human voice. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of things going on there. And and so what happens, I think, is when you're in that environment to, to get something down, there's, there's pressure, you know. And with Beverly, I found like she, she was letting things happen. She was letting it all happen. And I think that's, I think that's what produced a really good song. So, Talvin, um, what are you listening to at the moment? What's on your playlist? You know, to be honest, I haven't been listening to a lot of music um, because I have various instruments i practice and um some of them are very old and some string indian string instruments too what i've been trying to do recently is is learning how to be my own best listener Mm. so i'm playing and practicing my instrument whether it's tabla or surbahar or sitar keyboards, harmonium. I'm right now practicing to not be the musician who's listening to themselves, 
but be the listener who's listening to the musician. So kind of distance, separate yourself mm. from the from the doer, mm. you know. And I'm trying to learn how to do this and 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 just actually do it. Mm. And it's beautiful. It's, you start relaxing, your muscles relax, and anything you're practicing, your muscle memory works much faster. Mm. It takes it all in because you... That, you know, you, you're not holding attention. You want to listen to the best. You become an audiophile. You want the best sound. You want the best. You've got the VIP seat, mm. right? And the concert. You want the best. So your sound, your tone starts developing as well. I finish up every interview with some quick questions. And you have to tell me what you prefer. Quick to answer. Quick answers. Quick answers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Quick, quick questions, both. Okay, you'll okay. get it, you'll get it. Just stick with me, okay? So here we go. Dog or cat? Dog. I know that one. <laughs> How was your dog? Uh, he's good. I haven't seen him because he's, you know, he's a working uh, breed, so he's a clumber spaniel. Yeah. So Suffolk has been great for him. But, you know, he's he started slowing down. Okay, next one. Stones or beetles? Beetles. Analog or digital? Analog. Of course. Sea or snow? Sea. Okay, here's a hard one. Cricket or football? Cricket. <laughs> yes. Truth or dare? Truth. Book or film? Book. <laughs> Talvin, it's so nice to see you. Thank you so much for checking in with us. And uh, I look Always forward lovely to see you, Lisa. Yeah, you do. and I look forward to seeing you when this is all over. We'll come up for a visit. Yeah, and, uh, please do. Yeah, thank you. Thank Take you. care. For more info and to apply to one of our Project 7 songwriting retreats, visit us at project7.com. <laughs>